And generally what the bill does, the first few sections of the bill amend existing law in Title uh, 72, which is the sexual assault title uh, chapter uh, in uh, Title 13, which is crimes and criminal procedure. And it focuses a lot on the issues around consent. And so because this doesn't pertain necessarily to your jurisdiction, I'm just going to kind of scooch down, but just so you know what the first half of the bill is, is straight up judiciary. Um, so I think what you're interested in is starting on um, page four on in section four, the first one being data collection and reporting. Um, and uh, you'll see there that starting on line 20 on page four, uh, it said on or before September 1st of 2024 and then biannually after that, the Department of Public Safety is to provide a statistical report to the legislature based on data from the National Incident-Based Reporting System and the Vermont Judiciary on a number of following issues. And just a little background, and I think that Representative Colburn will talk to you about it when she testifies, is um, this section was developed in cooperation with the Department of Public Safety as well as the Crime Research Group. Um, and the network against domestic and sexual violence on trying to figure out what information is available, how can you best aggregate it, and then condense it into usable information for the General Assembly. So I did just want you to know that there was that input. Um, so you'll see on top of page five, um, so starting with subdivision uh, A, is that they're to report on the number of sexual violence cases reported um, uh, to any law enforcement officer agency. Subdivision B is there to report on the number of civil sexual assault or stalking orders that are granted. So this is separate and apart from what we have in the criminal realm is that there is a provision in Title 12 that allows someone to receive a civil protection order in cases of uh, sexual violence and, and uh, stalking. Subdivision C is the number of sexual violence cases referred by law enforcement to a prosecutor. So in A, you have the number of reports made to law enforcement. In C, you have then how many of those reported cases then are referred from law enforcement to a prosecutor for, to, for determining whether or not there should be charges. Then subdivision D is the number of cases that are charged, the nature of the charge and the disposition of those charges. And then you'll see in subdivision two, uh, the data has to be uh, organized and reported uh, county by county. Subsection B is directing the Department of Public Safety to make a reasonable effort to protect a victim confidentiality and uh, uh, when they're sharing that statistical information and it might be identifying that's put in there because, you know, we are in small communities here in Vermont and so that they're to consider the confidentiality when you have might have small numbers and, and how that might interact in terms of unintentionally identifying a victim. And then in subsection C, DPS is to post the data that's collected on their website in a manner that's clear, understandable and accessible to the public. So section five is the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council. So there was a predecessor to this council that was established by the General Assembly. And one of its recommendations was that the council or some version similar to that council continue and um, with more stakeholders and that they focus in on certain areas. And so I'll walk you through the language starting at the top of page six. Um, so creating the council for the purpose of a coordinated response to campus sexual harm, including across institutions of higher learning in Vermont. So you see the membership is in subsection B. So what you have in subdivisions one, two, and three is that for each of, so for the state colleges, for the University of Vermont, and for the Association of Independent Colleges, they are to each appoint a Title IX coordinator and a campus-based prevention education coordinator um, to, this, to this council. Subdivision four, um, there's to be two community-based sexual violence advocates appointed by the network. Subdivision five is there's two law enforcement or public safety representatives who have experience in responding to and investigating campus sexual violence, and those are to be appointed by the Commissioner of Public Safety. 
top of page seven in subdivision six, uh, the Center for Crime Victim Services is to appoint two college students, at least one of whom has lived experience as a sexual uh, violence survivor and one who represents a campus-based racial justice organization. Subdivision seven is a person with expertise in sexual violence responses within the LGBTQ community appointed by the Center for Crime Victim Services. Subdivision eight is a sexual assault nurse examiner appointed by the network. Um, sexual assault nurse examiners are uh, healthcare practitioners who are specifically trained to collect evidence um, when there has been a report of a, of a sexual assault. Subdivision nine uh, is a prosecutor with experience in prosecuting sexual violence cases, and it could be either someone who is within one of the state's attorney's offices, or it could be from the AG's office, and the AG is the appointing authority. And then subdivision 10 is an attorney with experience in sexual violence cases appointed by the Defender General. So subsection C is the, uh, the duties for the council. So they're supposed to do interdisciplinary planning and information um, to share support, uh, prevention programs on every college campus in Vermont. They're to do annual review of trends. Top of page eight, uh, development and distribution of best practices. Subsection D, uh, they are to have the administrative and technical assistance of the network. Um, I'll just say uh, there wasn't any clear uh, entity to staff, staff this necessarily. And so uh, the network uh, offered to, to do this and that's where the appropriation comes in a little later. Um, Subsection E is a report on or before uh, December in 2022, and then annually thereafter, they're to report uh, to the General Assembly with a summary of their activities and any recommendations for legislative action. So the first meeting is to occur uh, on or before September 15th of this year. Um, you'll see that on subdivision four, the counselor, council is to meet quarterly, so four times a year, uh, they're limited there. And subdivision five, your standard language around per diems and expenses. I think if you look at the uh, makeup of the committee, it's primarily uh, probably going to be, you know, maybe just the, the folks under subdivision six and eight. So the two college students and perhaps maybe the sexual assault nurse examiner who might be availing themselves of the per diems and the expenses. I think generally um, the other folks are probably gonna be compensated for whatever organization they're representing, but that's just a guess. Um, so uh, moving on to page nine and section seven with the appropriations. Uh, so there is, $13,000 appropriated to the network for purposes of staffing the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council and reimbursement of the per diems and, ex and uh, expenses. And then subsection B is kind of a standalone. There's no statutory language in or session law earlier in the bill related to this, but um, there's a $40,000 appropriation to the Center for Crime Victim Services to expand the forensic nursing program beyond hospitals. So right now that program uh, just operates in hospitals, but um, as you know, you know, there's not a hospital in every corner of the state and sometimes it's quite a bit of a drive to get to a hospital. And so they're looking to be able to extend those services um, to primary care and reproductive healthcare settings in underserved areas. Thank you. Um, and Representative whoop, Representative Colburn, do you wish to add to that? Thank you for that one. I'll, yeah, I'll add just a little bit. Michelle covered a lot. And I, I received by email some questions from Representative Squirrel this morning. And we've tried to um, make sure that we're addressing these. But please 
please let me know if I haven't addressed those to your satisfaction representative squirrel or anyone else. And I'm also happy to send you some responses in writing if that feels useful after, after hearing. I see that representative squirrels. Yeah. Raised, so I don't okay. know if I should be. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had one question that I didn't hear an answer to and uh, question why you chose the, uh, the date of July, 2028. Yep. To sunset the council. Yeah, um, I, I was going to share a, just a little additional information about okay. some of the appropriations and some of the sections. So why don't I walk through that and I will address that question. Okay. Um, and but thanks for thanks for flagging that one. Appreciate it. So you heard about sections one through three and you know, I think we're happy to do our best to answer questions about those, but as Michelle noted, they really relate to modernizing our sexual assault laws and the definition of consent. Um, in section four on the data collection and reporting, um, this is really aimed at getting us a better understanding of how these cases are coming forward and sort of when they're able to be fully charged and, and um, and all of that. And the, the language that you see in front of you really was developed with stakeholders from the Department of Public Safety and from the Crime Research Group who will be doing a lot of the back end support for this um, reporting. So there's plenty of capacity here. They all, they all uh, we heard actually multiple witnesses from DPS um, testified in support of the bill and in, sort of, in support of these provisions. So we're really confident that the reporting requirements here are achievable. Um, section five, the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Council, I can... Yeah, oh. excuse me, Rep Colburn, just why, why don't we pause section sure. by section oh, and sure. yeah. if there are questions here. I certainly had a question in section four about the capacity of the different entities to gather and collect the data. I, I understand and, and thank you for being clear that DPS said that they supported the bill. Or do they have the financial capacity and the staffing capacity to do the work that you have asked them to do in the bill? Yes. And, the, and I think a lot of the work will actually be done, a preliminary work will actually be done through the, by the crime research group with their existing funding. And then the, the um, data and reporting will be handed over to DPS to, to help finalize and present. Okay. So they have some support that's not articulated in the bill, but that really is a, a critical piece of um, like infrastructure and capacity for them. Yeah. I, I absolutely appreciate that and know that we need access to data. It's just that we frequently hear, hey, legislature, you asked us to do this work, but you did not provide us with the resources to do the work. And so your testimony is that the entities that are being asked to do this work have sufficient resources and um, you, inquired and they are not going to come to us and say we need more money to do this that is my understanding and i'm happy to get you some sort of like written confirmation of that if that would be helpful no, of course yeah. not but, but if that's the testimony that you all have received um a, you know we're appropriations so it's our job to ask these questions and we get a little bit grumpy when years later we hear about the costs that we added and what were we thinking of so yeah um yeah thank you Maida, uh representative townsend thank you thank you on this very point i just wanted to make sure everyone um was aware you know there's mention in the bill of the national incident based reporting system as a source for data um, already within the Criminal Justice Service Division of DPS, there is a subdivision within Criminal Justice Services called the Vermont Crime Information Center, and they already do work in support of the National Incident-Based Reporting System. So there's already a linkage uh, in place. Great. Thank you. 
Okay, um, Rep Colburn, you were moving us to section five. I don't see other questions on four. Great. Um, so section five, again, is the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Council. Um, I can talk about the need for this. Um, I will note that if you have really deep, and I can certainly talk about individual membership. Um, if you have really detailed questions about individual members, you may also want to hear from the government operations committee as they actually really worked on and finalized the language for this section. Um, as Ms. Childs noted, last biennium, we formed and funded a campus sexual harm task force with a very finite charge to evaluate and bring forward legislative proposals. And I served on this task force, so I'm happy to answer questions about its work. A key finding of this group um, that, that really kind of wove through all of our other proposals um, was a need for more infrastructure in the form of a statewide group or entity that could facilitate the pooling of resources, deeper collaboration between institutions, impacted individuals, community and criminal justice system partners, and development of shared best practices and more consistency across the state. Um, one of the things that came up again and again was just the huge variations in how institutions are able to resist source this work um, in campus settings. So the difference between a UVM or a Middlebury and a state college or a really small um, private school with different kinds of funding just came up again and again. And I think here with, with relatively minimal state investment, we can hopefully create a structure where we can really better leverage resources across all the institutions in support of collective work. Another thing that came up was the clear need for some staffing and infrastructure support. So there did actually exist a few years back, a really loose intercollegiate council, but it was really a volunteer effort and had to be coordinated by overworked Title IX coordinators and just was not positioned to embrace the scope of work identified as needed. And um, I believe that group is actually no longer meeting because it was just sort of not sustainable in its current form. Um, representatives of state agencies and institutions of higher education were on the task force. And as Ms. Childs noted, no entity offered their capacity to staff or coordinate this proposed council. So the network stepped in. Um, the estimated appropriation that you'll see in a subsequent section is really the minim minimum, minimal cost required to provide some staffing, pay for space rental and um, supplies such as paper, copying, etc. I would also add just, and this is really my observation, not the networks, that supporting sexual assault survivors and preventing sexual violence is really, really specialized work. And I, I think, and that the Vermont network is the entity statewide that is best positioned to coordinate this, that already has the most experience working across campuses, the criminal justice system, community supports. Um, I think they're a pretty natural fit for serving in this role. Uh, the previous task force that was established was very short term. I think we funded maybe six meetings this is really anticipated as a longer term entity that's positioned to make collective system changes over time as needed. Um, you know, sadly, the issue of campus sexual harm is probably not going away um, in, in the course of a handful of meetings. Um, You'll note that it does have a sensitive repeal in section six and to representative squirrels question this is, of course, so we can assess whether or not it could should continue. My understanding is that the um, length of time applied here is the standard term applied to longer term bodies by government operations so that General Assembly can um, routinely evaluate them. And as noted, the per diems likely will only be used by the student representatives, perhaps by perhaps by um, the, the nurses, but largely by the student reps, we think. Section seven um, 
brings us, oh, I should pause and see if there are questions about sections yeah. five and six, I, I apologize. So thank you, there are. Uh, Representative Jessup. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you both again. Um, so what I'm just trying to understand in terms of the timeline is the council, would you say that the council's charge, I mean, it's obviously multiple different, but would you characterize it overall sort of capacity building? Because I've actually attended some of those previous meetings by the volunteer groups. And I hear what you're saying. It is totally as you describe, overworked Title IX coordinators, really hard to pull together. People can't get away from their jobs, all the stuff that we all know, right? Especially for institutions where people are wearing multiple hats already. So, so the council, I mean, you have the data function and you're tying that into the crime victim, uh, to the existing, but is it capacity building that you're after largely, is that, or is that a, too narrow of a description? I think it's a few things. So I do think it's capacity building and it's, it's being able to leverage across institutions. Like what are we learning at a UVM or a Middlebury and able to put into practice and how can we support um, other institutions in kind of operationalizing that? Like how can we find some shared strategies and share resources? Um, I think there's also a really strong interest in some developing some best practices and some consistency across campuses. So for example, like we have statutory definition of consent, but each education of each higher education institution and state has its own definition of consent operating. So if you go from one institution to another, you might find, um, you might find really different parameters, definitions, uh, sort of guiding guiding the campus experience or, and understanding around consent. One of the things, an example that came up um, that our the task force was really, really interested in is thinking about piloting um, some models of restorative justice. So really looking at alternatives to the kind of campus adjudication process, which frankly, which um, frankly doesn't work for a lot of folks and there have been some really promising developments around the country and um, colleges that are using restorative justice models, but you got to do it right. That can that can be um, not a great alternative for someone to just kind of put together on a shoestring and try themselves. So that was a great example of something where they really wanted to work together to develop best practices that could be um, shared between institutions that could be that could be shared statewide that could create kind of consistent best practices in the state. Um, and then there, there also rose, and I think you'll see this in the charge, there were a lot of questions about, as there just tends to be in um, a lot of our work in uh, the justice system, questions about getting better data, getting a better statewide picture of what's happening um, that's that's less like institution to institution and and more allowing us to kind of look at some aggregate data and really understand trends and what's happening. So I think those those were um, hopefully you see those reflected in the language in the bill. But those are some of the reasons. Right. The reason I'm partly framing it like that is I'm thinking of Representative Squirrel's question about what sunsets when. And typically, if you're doing capacity building, the idea is you go in, you do a lot of work, you set things up, you get the consistency, although we know that resource allocation is really behind inconsistency, right? So that's that whole issue. Right. And then there's a stepping back, and that kind of gets to his question about the repeal. So that's what I'm trying to understand, like, is are you seeking to set up something sort of longer term or are you seeking to do that capacity building and then step back? And I, I think, frankly, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for the bill's sponsor, but I think it is about setting up something longer term and having the kind of um, just standard check-in that we would have for any entity. So that that repeal is my understanding is that's really um, 
standard for government operations to, to not just say, and it's going, going to go on and on and on forever. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily planned as like, and absolutely by 2028, the work of this entity will be done. I think it's meant to provide an opportunity for the General Assembly to really evaluate um, the function and usefulness of this entity at that point. So are you in, may I, Madam Chair, was just one more follow up. So would, given that you have the out year as the repeal and sunset, would this be an ongoing appropriation of some fashion until that sunset? Because how does one determine whether capacity is sufficient or not? Or how does that, um, how does that slope? How does that work in terms of dollars? Yep, I think it would be, you know, something that would we would need to keep assessing um, the staffing needs and if there continues to be a need for an ongoing appropriation or not. Um, I think it's I think it will be something that we'll need to come back to. For sure. OK. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I could I just say one more thing? I, the network has tested, did testify. I believe that it could potentially be a one-time appropriation. Um, and you know, I'd, I think you you could potentially want to hear from them. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So th this is this is our shot, um, and so if there are alternative okay. ways to be thinking about this, we'll need to take it out of the room and come back with a proposal for how to pro do this because we do not have time for testimony. Yeah, sorry. The, the, no, the no, no, no. level in the room is at least in my room is. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure you're getting all the information you need so I can do any follow up too. Yeah, thank you. So um, question I have on uh, section five is you've got 13 people on this committee or this commission. I'm sorry, I'm not calling, using the right words on the council. Um, that's a large number. Did you have a conversation about making it smaller? Um, we didn't uh, have a conversation about making it smaller. I think we were really working to get the right people in the room. Um, we did defer to the government operations committee for the detailed conversation on that. And they had coordinated with the house education committee about which of them would really dig in and take that on. But I, I will say my experience, um, and then I see that Michelle has her hand up too. My experience on the um, smaller task force, which was uh, similarly sized and, and, and a, a sort of similar mix of community criminal justice system and campus folks and impacted folks, that did really feel like the important and right mix of people to have at the table. These are really complex intersecting systems um, and the way they intersect often has really serious impacts and often detrimental impacts on survivors. And so the work of supporting survivors and making the experience on our college campuses more survivor friendly, I think really requires all of these players to be in conversation together in ways that they have not historically always been. Thank you. Um, Ms. Childs? I just wanted to mention that, um, uh, so I went to House Government Operations and worked with them on their recommendations to judiciary. There were actually more people on the council as the bill as introduced and originally kind of contemplated by House Judiciary and Government Operations pared it down, specifically with regard to the representatives from the institutions of higher learning. So. Uh, the bill is introduced had a Title IX coordinator from every college in Vermont, um, and so they kind of whittled that number down, but um, they, uh, they actually added the Defender General's representative on there, um, and uh, the 
the, I, I'm sorry if a representative Kobunari mentioned this, one of the recommendations from the earlier group that was working on this was a wider array of stakeholders. Um, and so that's why you see a, a number of folks representing different constituencies. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful to know. Um, so if there are no more questions on five or six, we are now at the appropriations section 13, which is uh, section seven, which appropriates $13,000. Can you tell us why, um, why that number? Yep, the number came from, you know, the network that, uh, so it's their estimate of what um, they would need to cover just really the minimum needs for staffing, for potential space rental, um, and for supplies. And I assume per diem, that is part of this. And the per diems are folded into there as well. And as we noted, yes, as we noted, we're anticipating really minimal use of the per diems. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm just, I'm thinking a wee bit about that. And I think we may want to pull out what the per diem is and have that as a separate amount and be clear about that and then appropriate if, and then I think we need to have a conversation about the other part of the appropriation. Um, so the question that I had had there, um, I just this morning was reminding the committee that um, we do not do um, direct appropriations normally to private entities. I was batted down by one of my colleagues who reminded me that we're not always consistent um, and I'm gonna get even with him. Um, but this, I am uncomfortable making an explicit appropriation to an entity that is um, not state government or not that we don't offer this out as a, um, that we don't um, bid it out. We do not normally sole source this sort of work. So I, we, can, can you tell me why I am wrong? <laughs> well, I think, so I, I having worked on this issue, um, a, there's not a, a single state entity that comes to mind to me, state agency, um, that or state government entity that comes to mind to me that has the breadth of experience and skills um, at pulling all of these intersecting systems and players together that the network does. I think you could um, go through an RFP process and put it out to bid. And I, and I think the likely result of that process, if the network chose to bid on it, is that they would very possibly emerge, very, very likely emerge as the clear, um, the clearest choice. And so I think we're, I, I'm really kind of speaking for myself here, but I think like there's efficiency in just naming that and and moving forward. Um, okay, thank you. I I would imagine that the Department of Public Health would um, be the logical place to have an interest in this. I, I I clearly understand what is trying to be created here. I understand it is a highly specialized area that in, on a personal level, I would say, deserves the attention you're trying to bring to it. I just think that this is, but it is broadly a public health issue. And that was where I was imagining um, this resides. That is also a way of saying, hey, Department of Public Health, this is a public health issue that deserves attention. Um, so we may want to have a conversation about that. Um, um, the second, um, in, the second part of this appropriation is related but not tied into the council 
itself. And so will you talk to us about that? Yes. So this is the additional appropriation of um, 40,000 to pilot new forms of access to the Vermont forensic nursing program. So these are really specialized exams that folks will have after being sexually assaulted and they they really are part of the investigation they collect evidence as well as just assessing the health impacts on um, a survivor of assault the program as it exists today is um, based in hospitals it's funded through the center for crime victim services through federal funding what this appropriation would do is um, expand the program to offer these exams in other settings. So currently you can only go to an emergency department as a hospital, at a hospital, and these funds would um, pilot the provision of care in primary care reproductive health settings. Um, so that folks can be, these are like, can be very traumatic, very lengthy exams. And the idea of being able to have it in a primary care setting or a reproductive health care setting, as opposed to having to go to a hospital <laughs> emergency room to do it, um, you can imagine would be very supportive to some survivors. It also, you know, might um, reduce the barrier of transportation of having to get to a hospital. So this is this is really an attempt to kind of pilot like what it, would it look like in some other settings to be able to um, provide these services. And I'll say uh, that that it really expanding and ensuring access to this program has been a really ongoing priority for the Judiciary Committee in my time there and, and beyond. Um, as I noted, these are really specialized trauma informed exams, you know, that could be very beneficial to folks in more rural parts of the state to have access to them in different settings. And so it really fits with a long held overall goal of the committee that Representative Jessup will be quite familiar with to ensure just access to justice um, to eliminate geographic injustice around the state in access to um, aspects of our justice system. So that's really the thinking behind behind this appropriation. Thank you. Uh, Rep Jessup. Yeah, as you might guess, I of course want to fully appreciate you for putting that in. That is a really important piece. And the just two questions I have was consideration given to uh, support to do the staffing for that because that, as we know, was a key backup. And then the other component that I recall was a really huge issue was the backlog of rape kits. It was just this ongoing thing. And I may be straying too far afield, but I feel like it's related to the money because those were the two pieces that often, even if you had everything else in place, um, in it, but th this takes off the third, which was the where, but there was also the what happens next with the kids. And then did you have uh, somebody available to do, as you, as you uh, covered the um, exam in the right way with the right um, kits so that the evidence would stand up should that move further through the process? Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's really the appropriation would be used Primarily, I think for staffing, tra for training folks, for getting to really setting up the integration of this service in some of those other kinds of settings that I described. So it's it's not about um, although there you know we continue to look at the existing underlying program. It, this is not about saying there's something wrong with the underlying program that's not working and it needs to be better funded. Um, 
and we need to, it's not like filling a gap in the underlying program. It's really trying to explore, this is trying to explore and set up what would it look like to provide um, this same service in different kinds of settings and um, perhaps allow us to go even further in the trauma informed nature of um, these exams. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm asking your totally answering your question, Representative Jessup, but my understanding is it's the funding would be used really for training folks in the primary care settings and reproductive health care settings and sort of standing up um, some, some models there. And I'm sorry to be talking so much committee members, it's just I do remember spending a lot of time on this. It's really important work and I really appreciate all the thought that's gone into it. And and one of the things we do is just try to think where are the resources needed, where are they ongoing, and where are the holes. So when you say the forty thousand dollars is building capacity, is it building capacity of health professionals plus, and that would sort of be the pilot, like you would you would have a uh, I don't know a rape crisis center on a campus, and um, there's always volunteers who are there. There's maybe a health professional. I don't know what the configuration is, but. I just or, would, yeah. yes, or um, it would train folks. I thought it, I should have mentioned that that is another potential setting where um, folks are thinking about piloting um, provision of these exams is actually campus health centers. So rather than, because currently what happens if you go to your campus health center and report a sexual assault, you are referred to the emergency room for this length the exam and um, can imagine that the stress and intensity of that um, additional step is um, a lot for for some survivors for most survivors I would hypothesize um, so right it's looking at like can we get some models of this in places like campus health centers and um, reproductive health centers and in in your own doctor's office potentially Books. So is the expectation that this 40, what is the expectation around this $40, $1,000 appropriation on an ongoing basis? Um, my, so my understanding is that this is really to fund a pilot um, and then to, and then further need would be assessed to be able to trial it in some locations. And how many locations would be, just give us some, can you give us some details about what that would look like? What is the 40,000 bias? I don't know the number of locations. Um, I, I, um, I can tell you the kinds of, so I've shared the kinds of settings, I think the the funding would largely be used, as I said, for training for training um, nurses. Yeah, so I'm not I I could certainly get a more concrete one, and I try to get a more concrete answer to that question to you by email. But okay, thank you. And did you ask the Center for Crime Victim Services, which, um, as you noted, and thank you for that I, uh, the note about the work that they have already done in this area. Did you ask them if they would fund this program? Um, we didn't ask them that. So the, the way the funding for this program works, it's funneled through the Crime Victim Service Center. It's federal funding mm -hmm. dollars. So it's very finite and it's very directed um, how it can be used. The network uh, does work with them to help administer the program and do the actual training, the trauma-informed mm -hmm. training of folks. Um, so this would be a collaboration between those yeah. two entities to actually implement. The Center for Crime Victim Services, yes, it is. Um, there are um, uh, parameters to how they can spend their money. I suspect this is fits in with those parameters. Um, so it's a, and, and yet, yes, it is finite, and I know it's declining, but uh, they, they would have the ability to uh, fund this sort of thing if they chose. And I, they do a broad array of 
of important work, but I believe this fits in with the sort of work they do. Uh, Robin? Um, thank you. And thanks for bringing this um, bill to us, um, Representative Colburn. And um, I think it's great. I, the, I have more questions on this 40,000 also. I think I heard you say it, you're kind of viewing it as a pilot. I'm still a little unclear on what we're getting for the $40,000. And if it's a pilot, how will we know if we're successful? Well, how are we gonna, what are we gonna measure this by? And, and that would give ammunition for being able to you know, ask for additional funds or get a, a bigger program set up because it seems to me that 40,000 is a nice start but doesn't get us that far. Um, yeah, so we we didn't hear testimony about like a formal assessment um, rubric. Uh, I think there's, um, you know, a very good case to be made and we did hear that for why, why this expansion into these other settings mm -hmm. um, is yes. kind, of, kind of common sense right. behind, behind it. Um, and I, I, you know, we, we, our committee is in continual conversation with um, the Crime Victim Services Center and, and the network on um, these services and related programs. And so I think we would anticipate very much that we would be hearing back from them about how it went, lessons learned, continuing need. Um, all of that. Mm -hmm. Did, is that where, were they the ones who recommended the 40,000? Still a little unclear on where that number got picked from. I think the, the recommendation came, um, well, from the, from the bill sponsor, Representative Copeland Hanses, who, okay. who worked with a number of stakeholders in crafting, in crafting the bill and um, certainly was advocated for by the network as well yeah. um, with, and with support of Crime Victim Services Center. Thanks. Okay. Um, Representative Colburn, do you, could, could you um, help us understand the scope of the problem that is being addressed here? And by that, I mean, do you have, can you tell us how many victims, what do we believe the number of victims of, of sexual assault is in the state of Vermont? I mean, I'm just trying to, and I know that we do not in fact know what the actual number is, but in terms of reported um, numbers and, and what, what the thought is around the total possibilities? Um, so I, I didn't come with statistics about the number of uh, reported sexual assaults for you, but we know from statistics that um, I think it's between one and five and one and four college students will be sexually assaulted. Um, we know that those risks increase for women, for LGBTQ plus folks, for, um, for people of color. Um, and we know that there's a huge amount of that just goes underreported. And I can tell you, uh, as a representative in the legislature and, and also at the municipal level of what I think is probably the most college student dense district in the state, that this is a huge, huge issue for my constituents. They continually feel let down by the process and the experience they have in college settings when they have experienced assault or other forms of sexual harm. And it's just, and the stories I've heard, I mean, I've heard so many stories in my role representing um, young people in these settings. And I have, I have, never heard someone say like, I, it really worked for me. I really felt like I received justice. I felt like I received healing. I felt like my education wasn't interrupted by this or compromised by this experience. I, I hear the opposite of that. Like every single time I talk to someone who has been through this experience and there is a, a huge need, I believe to, um, 
address this issue in the in these settings and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what we're trying to, to do here with this bill. Thank you. I'm I'm just trying to do I'm now speculating in my mind, but I'm guessing there is upwards of 20,000 students in the state of Vermont in different colleges around the state at a at a minimum. Um, Peter, how many how many students are there in the state college system? Oh, somewhere in the vicinity of ten thousand. But remember, a lot of some are uh, are um, are just someone course. returning for one course, things like that. So yeah. I can't tell you the full time to part time. Yeah, yeah. So clearly, upwards of twenty thousand um, individuals associated who are students in one way or another in higher education around the state, and uh, one out of four, one out of five. Um, is the thought in terms of, of, of the violence that may be perpetuated upon them. Okay, um, I committee, I uh, so thank you, Representative Colburn and um, Ms. Childs for your presentation. Very interesting, important work. Um, I think we have a few questions about um, the appropriations section of this committee. Um, do you do do are there issues with the appropriation section? Do we need to modify this in any way? Um, I raised the question about um, separating out the um, per diems from um, the appropriation uh, that would be provided to support this, and I'm also questioning making the direct appropriation to the network. I totally understand the efficiency. I just am worried about the slippery slope um, in terms of, of this. And um, so committee, what are your druthers? Or do you wanna go away and think about it committee and come back to me with a recommendation for what we should do here? I'm also aware that it is five of 12. We are over our time and you guys have been going for a long time. What do you wanna do committee? You know I'll keep you sitting here until we're done. Let's let's talk about it when we come back. Uh, Peter and then uh, Trevor. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, you know, I, I I agree with your your thoughts about separating out the uh, the um, um, the thirteen thousand dollar appropriation. I think that it, we always reflect uh, the appropriation for boards, councils, etc. Uh, separately, and I think it'd be a good thing to do that. Um, and then the the balance it would just be a matter of of uh, you know how do we how do we send that to an appropriate entity to actually conduct the uh, to hold to, as a place to hold it and provide the support for it. So um, that's that's to be determined. But yeah, I, I do agree. We need to break that out. Okay. Um, and just uh, thank you. Um, and incidentally, I am not asking the same question about the Center for Crime Victims um, Services because in fact, we do have a statutory relationship with them. And that's the reason I, it, 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 you know, we appropriate their money. So why not? This is just an additional appropriation there, which actually may be part of the solution. Um, Trevor? Yeah, that was, it. that was exactly my thought that maybe uh, we could do some language changes here and, and direct these resources, money resources to the center with the idea that we're probably directing to the Vermont network anyway, but it kind of uh, uh, meets some of your concerns and some of my concerns also around this. I think we have a couple more questions that I think uh, Representative Colburn was gonna bring back to us some answers to also. Okay. So I, I'd like to you know have another conversation about this, of course. Okay, so do a little bit of work, but I think we just um, found a solution which is that, um, so we need to separate, we have a plan. So let's, let's um, call it noon. Um, we're not going to make a decision. We'll have a conversation about how to proceed. We're gonna, yeah, 
So we're in good shape. Thank you very much, Rep Colburn and Ms. Childs for your time with us this afternoon and committee for your work on this. Let us um, go off live. Thank you.